starting to get a collection of paper clips up here. I'm holding my sermon together. It's the little things, what can I say, you know? Uh, again, welcome. And, you know, this morning we're going to be continuing our study on Acts. And as we have looked at the book of Acts so far, really the birth of the church after Jesus ascended into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to really empower the early church, to grow the early church. That's the Holy Spirit's mission. We just get in line with that. For the last 2,000 years, the church has been seeking to be in line with the Holy Spirit for the building, not just the building of the church, but the advancing of the gospel, the advancing of the kingdom of God even here on earth. So for those of you who have your bulletins, uh, pull those out. Just before we read there, I almost forgot, I wanted to pray as we have been doing over the gifts and the tithes that have been brought into the house of the Lord in the past week. Just recognizing that giving, likewise, is a part of our worship to God. So we don't want to neglect it, we don't want to exalt it, but we do want to acknowledge it before the Lord. So let's just pray right now. Father, we come to you just considering the faithfulness of your people, considering your faithfulness, Lord, considering that you have given us everything. It's all yours, Lord. And so out of the generosity of our hearts, we give back to you a portion of that in worship for the purpose of the kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would take the, that you would actually not just take, that you would receive the monies and such that have been given. Lord, that you would multiply it for the purposes of the kingdom of God. And Lord, that you would bless the givers as well. Um, and we just commit it to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, back to the bulletins, that little thing at the top that I always write. E.M. Bounds, I don't know if anybody's heard of him. He uh, was around the turn of the 19th century, late 1800s, early 1900s, I believe, uh, was really known for prayer, wrote several books on prayer. And he once made this statement, four things let us ever keep in mind. God hears prayer. God heeds prayer. God answers prayer, and God delivers by prayer. The early church understood this full well. They had a God-sized task, proclaiming Jesus and making disciples of every nation, and they faced overwhelming odds, and resistance to their message was growing. Instead of relying on their own wisdom, plans, or programs, they cast themselves on God, and his resources. And God proved himself continually to be El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. If you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, please turn to Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 23, going to 31, and I'm reading from the New International Version today. On their release... Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one, or his Christ. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats 
and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now there's a takeaway <clears throat> of this entire scripture in just one sentence, as you know I like to do. It's that no matter what needs we bring to prayer, the answer is often a greater infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's that infilling of the Holy Spirit that enables us to accomplish those things that we've brought to God in prayer. D.L. Moody, most of you folks have heard of him. <clears throat> he was a shoe salesman from Chicago who fell in love with Jesus and started sharing his faith with everyone he met. And even though he was never ordained and he never had any formal training, God used him to reach thousands for Christ as an evangelist. Once there was a group of British pastors who were planning a crusade, and the name of D.L. Moody came up as a possible preacher. One British pastor said with skepticism, why do we need this Mr. Moody? He's unordained, uneducated, and unex inexperienced. Who does he think he is? Does he think he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? But another wiser pastor who had heard Moody preach responded, Mr. Moody doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. Does the Holy Spirit have a monopoly on you? Does the Holy Spirit have a monopoly on me? I certainly want to be able to say yes to that for both you and for me. Let's make sure that we give ourselves over to God so much that he has that monopoly on us. As we've looked at the book of Acts, going over the background as we always do, just a reminder, this is the bridge between the Gospels and everything that comes after it, all the letters and such, and that it gives us that historical context for the letters as well as for the early church, what actually happened. Without the book of Acts, we wouldn't know very much about the early church. And especially through the book of Acts, we're seeing the presence of the Holy Spirit building the church and expanding the kingdom of God through Spirit-empowered believers. Last week, we looked at Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. Peter and John were arrested after having healed, actually the Holy Spirit having healed through them, a man who had been lame for more than 40 years, and that after he's healed, a crowd gathers and they preach to the crowd in the name of Jesus, and they tell the people about Jesus, and that just really frustrates, annoys, and angers the leaders, the Jewish leaders, who arrest them and hold them overnight. And then that leads to, um, well, that led to last, last week's sermon as well, where they were brought, John and Peter were brought before the Sanhedrin. They were told, don't talk anymore, don't teach anymore in the name of Jesus. And Peter issued a challenge right back to them, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to God. You be the judges, for as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And because the Jewish leaders feared the people, because the people were celebrating the miracle, celebrating what God had done, and many of them, in fact, had become Christians at that point as well, um, the Sanhedrin, the members of the Sanhedrin, so feared the people, they didn't try to punish Peter or John any more than that, but they released them with continual threats, even after Peter said, no way, we are defiant in your face about your order. So now we get to verse 
23, verses 23 and the first part of verse 24. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. You know, it's notable that it never even entered into the minds of Peter and John to obey the Sanhedrin. They didn't think, I could get punished, I could get thrown in jail, I could be executed. It didn't matter. It did not even enter into their heads to not preach about Jesus. They could not stop talking about him. And so they take this full report of what has happened, the healing, the imprisonment, the threats of the Sanhedrin, their response to the Sanhedrin. They take that back to their own people. And literally it just says it, they take it back to their own. Now, you know, sometimes when you're reading commentaries, it seems like people just get bogged down on the tiniest little details. And so, you know, I am suffering for Jesus for you guys when I have to go through those commentaries. Uh, just so you know sometimes. Because, you know, everybody's talking about what does it mean to go back to their own? Is it talking about, you know, the, the vast numbers, you know, the thousands now have believed? Is it just the, the ten other disciples that were the real core group? Was it maybe that about 120 believers, give or take just a little bit? I think it's probably that last one. But, boy, there's an awful lot of pages that people write. Just, it's like, that's not the point. The point is that they went back They shared it, and what happened next? Because it says that once the believers had heard the full report of what had happened in the temple, what had happened with the Sanhedrin, note what those threats move them to do. Verse 24, the first part of it. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They go to God in prayer. They go to God together. And they go to God in unity of heart, mind, and spirit. And you know, it says where it says they raise their voices together. That's the NIV. It's also translated as they raise their voices in one accord. The New King James and others say that. You know, we've seen this phrase three times already in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, chapter 2, verse 1. In chapter 2, verses, verse 46, with one accord. It's the Greek word homothumadon. And the Blue Letter Bible.org gives this beautiful explanation of that Greek word. It means with one mind, with one accord, with one passion. Here's the key thing it's a unique Greek word. It's found 11 times in the New Testament. Ten of those 11 occurrences occur in the book of Acts, which helps us understand the uniqueness, its uniqueness of the, of the Christian community here. Homothumadon is a compound of two words meaning to rush along and in unison. The image is almost musical. A number of notes are sounded which, while different, harmonize in pitch and tone like the instruments of a great concert under the direction of a concert master, so the Holy Spirit blends together the lives of members of Christ's church. That's what it means to be in one accord, like this great symphony of God. And that's what the early church was, and that's what the church today, God's church, not just us, everybody who is part of God's church, needs to be that, needs to have that same one accord. As it says in Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Our unity pleases God. It's part of that image of God that the world gets to see. It's in fact how the world, we're known to the world. We're known to the world by our love for one another, being in one accord. And way too often, we're known about our arguments from one church to this church or within the church. We need to be of one accord, folks. We need to pray and ask God to bring that unity of spirit to his church. 
So then we move on to the second point, the reliance, verses 23b through 26. And verse 24b says, Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. The word translated sovereign Lord is not the common word that's used for Lord in the New Testament. That word is kurios, and this is actually the Greek word despotes, which is where we get the English word despot. It was a word used of a slave owner or a ruler ruler who has power that cannot be questioned. So when they're saying sovereign Lord, they're saying basically not just, you know, Lord, but Lord, the one who cannot be challenged, the one who cannot be questioned, the one who has all power, benignly, kindly, not like a despot, that, you know, which our English word means of, of someone who basically cruelly uses their power. But it's that all-encompassing power. This is the sovereign Lord. And then look what they follow up with it. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And basically, by combining this term sovereign Lord with talking about these acts of creation, the implication is that God, being the one who created the world and being that sovereign Lord, is more powerful than everyone and everything he has created. And so therefore, nothing can thwart his plans. The creation cannot stop the plans or the intents of the creator. There's, it, that's an impossibility. And there's an application here as well when we look at how they prayed. Sovereign Lord, and they note what he did with creation. We do well to remind ourselves who God is. His infinite and unlimited power, his strength, his wisdom, his holiness, his love, especially when we pray. It's really a good idea as we're praying to remind ourselves of who God is. You know, and with this, sometimes people can go, oh, you know, it just sounds like you're buttering up God by telling him how wonderful he is. No, you know what we're really actually doing with that? We're speaking to our own souls and to our own expectation so that when we bring our requests to God, just when we come to him to worship him, it's because we're recognizing not only who he is, but he has all resources, all love, all power. He's the one that when we, ta- when we take our request to him, we can actually count on the fact that he can meet those needs over and abundantly way beyond we could ever ask or imagine. And so when we're saying those things, it increases our expectation of who God is and what he can do. So then verse 25, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David, uh, of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up And the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. You know, with those two verses, 25 and 26 there, the disciples demonstrate the same kind of pattern that we see when Peter's preaching. They are quoting scripture. In this case, the Old Testament scriptures, those were the only ones that they had at that point. And just like Peter, they're making those scriptures the basis of their prayer, just like Peter made those scriptures the basis of his preaching. And note there as well, their recognition of the Holy Spirit. You spoke by the Holy Spirit. It's that same Holy Spirit who has been infilling them and empowering them and working miracles through them since the day of Pentecost. You spoke through the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of your servant, our father David. You're still working through us by that same Holy Spirit. So then they go on to quote the first two verses of Psalm 2. That's that's where that quote comes from. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. 
Commentator William Barclay makes this note. The word translated rage is used for the neighing of spirited horses. They may trample, they may toss their heads, but in the end, they have to accept the discipline of the reins. Men may make their defiant gestures against God. In the end, God must prevail. Why do the nations rage? And then why do the nations plot in vain? In vain, or plotting in vain, has also been translated in other uh, translations like devise futile things, make useless plans, plot foolish things, and imagine empty things. That's, that's what it's meaning when it says, you know, why do the people plot in vain? These are empty useless things that they are trying to come up with. And consider this, raging and plotting against the creator God and his plans. How dumb is that? We're not going to win. There is no way. I mean, what are your chances of succeeding really against the God who has created everything? Three words, zero, zip, nada. Not going to happen. And yet, people still do. To this day, people rage against God. We see it. I mean, all you have to do is turn on the news, click on a news site, and you see essentially the results of people raging at God, his creation, his order, his rule. And because of the fact that we are assured that God is on the throne, and that he's in control. We can look, actually, if we, it's not even quoted here, the next couple lines down in Psalm 2, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. That's his reaction to them raging against him. So we need to stop worrying or being anxious about what's going on in the world around us. We're going to see lawlessness increase. We're going to see unrighteousness increase even abounding, God is still in control. He told us this was going to happen. And instead, we just need to seek God for his intervention. Because only he can change people's hearts. Only he can reveal truth to the people that are hardened against truth, who long to embrace and defend lies against the truth. And you know, ultimately, only God can bring revival. And so we need to be crying out to God for that revival. And then as it continued with that quote from Psalm 2, the second line there, the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed one. When you look at who is all there together, and this moves us into the relevance of why, why we... You know, what we, why was that quoted there? It notes, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant whom you anointed. So look at that, Herod and Pontius Pilate, the kings of the earth that were just quoted about. Luke notes, actually, in his, in his gospel, on, in chapter 23, verse 12, that the, the day that Jesus was crucified, that Pilate had sent Jesus over to Herod, and Herod was glad because he wanted he had never he had heard about Jesus, he hadn't met him. And then you know they both end up mocking Jesus at some point. But it notes that that day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before that, they had been enemies. So here you have the kings of the earth gathering against the Lord's anointed. And then you have the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city, in other words, uh, Jerusalem, conspiring with Herod and Pilate against Jesus. You know, um, this was an unprecedented joining of all the powerful forces. Herod, Pilate, the Jews, and the Gentiles, all coming together against Jesus, the Lord's anointed one, the Lord's Christ. And you know, a thousand years ago, when David lived, a thousand years before this occurrence. When David lived, the Holy Spirit moved him to prophesy this. 
in Psalm 2. Verse 28, they did what your power and your will had decided should happen. This verse shows that God is always in control, even when it looks like evil is winning. Without violating the free will of any person involved in this, God accomplished his purposes. And just as he, just like today, without violating our free will, without violating the free will of anybody, God is still accomplishing his purposes. God purposed Christ to die for our sins, but he did not, like an evil spirit, possess Herod or Pilate to accomplish his will. He didn't somehow possess the Jewish leaders or the Romans that nailed Jesus to the cross in order, you know, he didn't, he didn't do any of that. He, they did that on their own, but he knew they were going to do it. And he used their actions and their free will to accomplish his purpose, which was the salvation of the world. And so, when we're always asking, what's this mean to me? What can I learn from this? How can I utilize this in my life? A heavenly perspective is needed here, folks. It's needed in our lives. God is in control. Remember that. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't fret about what's happening in the world. You know, got to remember, it's been 2,000 years since Peter said to the people on the day of Pentecost, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This is the last days. It was basically him saying, this is the start of the last days. They thought it might be weeks, months, something like that. It, we've been 2,000 years of the last days, which probably means at some point here we are in the last minutes, maybe the last seconds. I certainly hope so. But God tells us in Scripture that the world's going to get darker and that sin's going to abound more and more. He tells us in Matthew 24, verse 12, because lawlessness will, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And he tells us in Matthew 24, verse 7, nation will rise against nation. We see that plenty of that happening, of that, uh, of that kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. God's told us it's going to happen. It's happening. We don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. We don't need to be anxious. We may lose everything except Jesus. But you know, that's a trade-off of all trade-offs. That is, that is worth way more than just the gold in Fort Knox. It is the very best thing that we could have if we lose everything and we keep Jesus and we remain in Jesus. That's what matters. And so God, what, you know, note what God never tells us to do. He does not tell us to panic. He does not tell us to get depressed. He does not tell us to become negative. And he doesn't tell us to be fearful. In fact, the Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to keep our eyes on heaven. We need to have that heavenly perspective. You know, and it doesn't mean that we don't continue to fight for righteousness whether it's here in Panama City, here in the U.S., or even throughout the globe. It just means that our hope and our focus is on Jesus. Our hope and our focus is not on our town, it's not on our state, it's not on our country, it's not on anything in the world of the world system. It's on Jesus. And the disciples recognized that because then they moved into the request Verses 29 and 30. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I want you to notice something here. Up till now in this prayer, the believers in what they've been saying, it's almost like this extended reflection on God's sovereignty. He's the one in control. He's the one they can depend on. And now in just two sentences, a rather small portion of the whole prayer there, 
they present their problem and they make their petitions to God. An awful lot of this prayer was just celebrating God and reminding themselves who he was, who he is. Now, Lord, consider their threats. You know, when people threaten God's children, he takes it personally. For everyone who's a parent in this room or has been a parent at some point, if somebody threatens your child, do you take kindly to that? Do you just go, oh, that's okay? Or does that anger you? Do you want to move in and protect them? Do you want to come to their defense? Remember, when people threaten us, we're God's children. And he does not take kindly to that. And this reminded me as I was reading it of King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah in the Old Testament. He was a king of Judah. And in Isaiah's chapter 36 and 37, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, had come and had attacked the fortified cities of Judah, had captured quite a number of them, and then he sent his field commander with a very large ar army to Jerusalem to lay siege against it and wanted to conquer it, wanted to conquer King Hezekiah. And at one point in laying this siege, Sennacherib writes a letter to Hezekiah ridiculing Israel's God, Yahweh. And this was Hezekiah's response when he received and read the letter, and it's in Isaiah chapter 37, verses 14 through 20. He went up to the temple of the Lord and spread the letter out before the Lord. So here's come threats, here's come mockery. This is what the apostles did as well. When they got the threats, what they do? They went to prayer, they went to the Lord. This is what King Hezekiah did. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Where have we heard that before? Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to all peoples and, and all their lands, they have thrown their gods in the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of earth may know that you, Lord, you, Yahweh, are the only God. And after Hezekiah had finished praying, Isaiah the prophet received a lengthy and scathing response against Sennacherib from God. And beginning with verse 36, this was the result. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp that was around Jerusalem. And when the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god in Israel, his sons, Adramelech and Sherezer, killed him with the sword, and they escaped the land of Ararat. And Ershahadan, his son, succeeded him as king, mocking God and threatening his people is not a smart thing to do. So let's look now more closely at the disciples' requests here. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Now, I want to ask you, if you had received threats, potentially against your very life, if you spoke or talked about Jesus. Would you pray this prayer? What would you pray? Would you pray for protection and safety? Would, would we pray for the threats to stop? Would we pray maybe that the people who are threatening us 
would suddenly get an extended work transfer to Alaska, preferably above the Arctic Circle. Lord, just take him out of my life. Somehow. I don't care how. Just get, get him out of here. Look what they do. They pray to be able to proclaim the good news of Jesus with great boldness. They don't pray for it to go away. The challenges, the threats, the risk. They just pray for great boldness in the face of that. You know, prayers for wisdom, protection, and favor with authorities, with the culture, all that. I mean, these are appropriate petitions. Lord, protect me, give me wisdom, all this. But the prayer here that they prayed is for the ability, and it's a prayer we need to learn too. It's a prayer for the ability to be obedient to Christ's command. In this case, it was to be obedient to Christ's command to preach the gospel. So they were saying, God, you've given us this command. Give us the power to do it no matter what. And then now, here, look at their second request, verse 30. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The disciples asked that God will demonstrate his power through the name of Jesus, through healings, signs and wonders, in order to bring validity and attention to the message of Jesus. The signs and wonders in and of themselves are only secondary. It's all about proclaiming Jesus. It's all about authenticating that message. It is all about actually showing the power of Jesus. And at some point even, his right to be Messiah, his right to be their sovereign Lord. And you know, those two lines of prayer that they do there, it's a great model of prayer. And it's not just for evangelism. We need, in fact, we shouldn't hesitate to ask God, give us a holy boldness to talk about Jesus. You know, if you're fearful, if you're timid, if you're painfully introverted, start asking God for boldness. It's a great place to start. You don't have to muster it up on your own. You just have to ask for it. And then there's some point You just have to be obedient and trust that he's going to give that to you. And you know, even if you do it in the most faltering way, if you do it out of a heart of love, people sense that. We are in a loveless world, folks. We're in a loveless culture, ultimately. So to share Jesus is to share God's love to a world that really needs love. We also need to ask God, as this prayer shows us, for his empowering through his Holy Spirit. Because it's a broken and dying world, and it needs to be touched. We're Christ's hands and feet. So it's not wrong to ask God to heal through you. It's not wrong to ask God to perform signs and wonders through you, as long as you're not looking for any glory for yourself. If you're looking for the glory of the Lord. By all means ask, Lord, use me. Bring no attention to me. That's what Peter and Paul did. That's what the other apostles did. Whenever anybody tried to give them any credit whatsoever, they're like, no, 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 not us. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God. That's what matters. That's where the power comes from. That's what it's pointing you back to. And as I had mentioned a couple weeks ago, all these gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're just the currency of the kingdom of God. And they're intended to be spent for the advancement of God's kingdom here in this lost, sinful world. So finally, let's look at verse 31, God's response. After they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You know, this may have been some kind of earthquake. We're not really told anything beyond somehow the place where they were meeting meeting was shaken. But it was God demonstrating that he heard their prayer, 
that he was responding to it favorably. And in that shaking, it was a, a visible, tangible sign, not unlike the tongues of fire when they were first given the Holy Spirit. So the shaking was then accompanied or immediately followed. We're not told which here exactly. The, you know, did it happen right when the shaking was happening that they got that fresh outpouring of the Spirit or did it come right after that? We're not told, but you know, they got a, ref- a new infilling, a new enabling by the Holy Spirit again. And you know, the result, they spoke the word of God boldly. Exactly what they had prayed for, exactly what they asked for, they got the empowering to be able to do that. J. Wilbur Chapman was an American evangelist and pastor who lived from 1859 to 1918. Once when he was in London, he had the opportunity to meet General William Booth, who along with his wife Catherine had founded the Salvation Army. Booth at that point was past 80 years of age. Dr. Chapman listened reverently as the old general spoke of the trials and the conflicts and the victories that he had experienced over his life. And then the American evangelist asked the general if he would disclose his secret for success. Dr. Chapman said he hesitated for a second. Booth hesitated. And I saw the tears come into his eyes and steal down his cheeks. And then he said, I will tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities, but from the day I got the poor of London in my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth that there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. Dr. Chapman said he went away from that meeting with General Booth knowing that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of surrender of that person. And so we come back to the beginning. No matter what needs we bring to prayer, the answer is often a greater infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives in order to answer that prayer, in order to meet that need. And I want to just finish up with a couple of quotes. This one from Charles Spurgeon. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. We are as ships without a wind. We are useless. Corey Ten Boom, who had been imprisoned in the Nazi death camps for her and her family hiding Jewish people, had said this. Trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. And then R.A. Torrey. If we think of the Holy Spirit only as an impersonal power or influence, then our thought will constantly be, how can I get hold of and use the Holy Spirit? But if we think of him in the biblical way, as a divine person, infinitely wise, infinitely holy, infinitely tender, then our thought will constantly be, how can the Holy Spirit get hold of and use me? One last one from Hudson Taylor. The prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of weakness, failure, and disappointment, let us answer God's standing challenge. Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things 
which thou knowest not. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example you give us with the early believers of lives so sold out to you that nothing of this world could hold on to them and that no fear could stop them because they recognized in you all the resources of heaven. If they needed boldness, they could ask for it and receive it from your Holy Spirit. If they needed wisdom, they could ask for it and receive it from your Holy Spirit. No matter what they needed, they could ask for it and receive it from your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we likewise want to come before you, before you today And we pray, infill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Enable us to speak the word of Jesus boldly. To speak the name of Jesus. To speak truth to a world that is immersed in lies. To bring love to a world that only knows anger, hatred, division, attack. Lord, the darker it gets, the more your light shines, the more your light illuminates. And so, Lord, we want to be like Hudson Taylor. We want to be like William Booth. Take us, Lord. Use all of us. Help us to be completely sold out to you. And we ask all these things in the name of the one who died for us, Jesus, your son. Amen.